It is 2005. I'm climbing up an old trail to the top of a hill. And I am bursting with nervous energy. You know that buzz you feel in your chest when you're taking a risk? Maybe jumping off a rock into a cold lake. Or asking someone out on a date. Or in my case, leaving everything, my job, my apartment, my savings, and taking off overseas. Now, at the time, I was no adventurer. I had spent years in school studying and researching climate change. But like most climate scientists, I had done so from within the relative safety of climate-controlled buildings. I studied oceanography a thousand miles from the nearest ocean. The only salt water was in the seal exhibit at the local zoo. The seals and I, we used to look at each other wondering, are, are we in the wrong place? I needed to understand what climate change meant to people around the world. And so this hill on this drought-prone island in Fiji is where I was going to start. So I reached the top, and all around me is sky, like every direction, just sky. The view, it, it is so vast, you can almost see the curvature of the Earth. And it, it is curved. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, this is it, right? I mean, this is what we're changing. But then I have this unexpected thought. It is hard to believe we can change all this. And don't get me wrong, I mean, the science is clear. Humans, through burning fossil fuels and other activities, are 100% responsible for climate change. But there I am, a climate scientist, standing atop a hill at the beginning of this grand adventure. And I briefly wonder how it is that humans, piddly little humans, could possibly change something as big as the climate. So my next thought, well, is a bit more blunt. Where did that thought come from? And admittedly, there were some four-letter words thrown in. I spent 15 years trying to answer that question. And this is what I found. In that moment, it wasn't my knowledge, I mean, it wasn't science that failed me. It was my imagination. You see, experts will tell you that climate change is a failure of our politics, our markets, or our morality. But beneath all of that is one thing. Climate change is a failure of the imagination. We have been unable or unwilling to see the world in a new way. And this has led to denial, to inaction, to fear, to anxiety. But worst, it's led to us not grabbing this incredible opportunity to create a cleaner and safer world. And so there are three stages to this. The first stage is just imagining that we can change the climate at all. And our struggles here are really not that surprising. For thousands of years, most human civilizations believed that climate and the sky were outside of human control. I mean, the entire basis of Western civilization, where we live in communities and we grow food, is that we manage the land and the gods manage the sky. Oh, we can communicate with the sky. We could uh, pray for the rain to nourish our crops. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we usually pray that it will stop raining. But we're not supposed to be in charge. And that, those doubts, that's so deep that even a climate scientist can stand atop a hill and for a very brief moment think, wow, it is kind of hard to believe. For years, fossil fuel interests and others took advantage of these inherent doubts to spread misinformation and to seed mistrust. They got people arguing with each other about physics as if physics cares about your arguments? The good news is that most people have passed this first stage. Now, around 80% of people across North America trust the scientific evidence that humans are responsible for recent climate change. But this takes us to the second stage, imagining that climate change can affect us personally. When I began studying climate science all those years ago, 
There was this notion that in North America, with our relative wealth and infrastructure, that we're insulated from the worst effects of climate change. If you want to experience climate change, you have to go somewhere, to the high Arctic, or to Bangladesh, or like me, to coral islands in the Pacific Ocean. But that was wrong. You don't have to travel halfway around the world to see climate change. It's right outside your door. Climate change has fueled extreme weather events around the world over the past few years. Heat waves, forest fires, floods, droughts. In 2021, we had an unprecedented heat wave right here in British Columbia. The thermometer at one weather station reached almost 50 degrees Celsius, 121 degrees Fahrenheit in Canada. Food at that temperature is considered cooked. Now, my family, like most people around here, don't have air conditioning. Our place was designed for the old climate, not the changing reality. And so I was working on the United Nations climate report while wearing a bathing suit, surrounded by fans that were blowing air over little bowls of ice that I put out. We are waking up to the reality of climate change. And our attitudes, they are changing as climate extremes hit home. So now more than three quarters of people across North America, but also Europe and Asia, are worried about the effect that climate change is going to have on their lives. So this brings us to the third stage, the one most of us are in now, and the one that worries me the most, imagining we will really solve this problem. You see, for most of human history, we've powered our lives the same way, by burning carbon. First, it was wood or charcoal for cooking and warmth. Later, coal, oil, gas, for electricity, for transportation, for heating and cooling. And these fuels, they have provided much of the world with unprecedented prosperity. But they now pose a risk to our future, and we are collectively struggling to imagine that there's another way. The solutions, they're perceived as threats by many. Fossil fuel interests are afraid of losing power. Governments are afraid of losing elections. Many of the rest of us are afraid of losing our jobs or our livelihoods or just, you know, sort of losing what we know. Why? We are rooted in old systems. Too many people in positions of power have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo and in quashing your imagination. Think about it. Here in Canada, we use the term natural resources mostly to refer to oil and to gas. But what else are natural resources? There's that thing. It, it rises during the day. It, it's really bright. And it, it actually created all of the oil and gas. Right? The sun. Between the sun, winds, and flowing waters, we have all the natural resources we need to power homes, vehicles, factories, and businesses, and to do so with clean energy. We also have schools, which we can use to train people to find ways to store and deploy all that energy. And the reason this matters is that these solutions, they're good ideas regardless of climate change. And let me give you just one example. Burning fossil fuels, in addition to causing climate change, causes air pollution, like smog. Air pollution, the scourge of the Industrial Revolution. It killed as many people last century as the world wars combined. It contributes to millions of deaths around the world each year. And if we transition away from fossil fuels, we can eliminate most air pollution. Oh, and we'd, we'd also solve climate change. I mean, what an opportunity, right? I mean, what a time to be alive. Over the next few decades, we have this incredible chance to create a safer, better world for ourselves and for future generations. But to get there, we need those imaginations. We need the courage, the guts, to see a different future and to chart the path there. I mean, try to imagine a future with fewer asthmatic kids because the air is cleaner. Or imagine quiet streets, not because of a pandemic, but because electric vehicles are quiet. Imagine hearing the birds in the morning, 
because we've restored landscapes to pull carbon out of the air. Now, none of this is going to be easy. The longer we delay the transition, the harder it's going to be, and the more people are going to suffer. The good news is that all of the research shows that slowing climate change is a net winner, and not just in terms of our, the environment, and not just in terms of our health, but in terms of jobs and the economy. The bad news, the jobs, they're not all the same, and they're not all in the same places. And that's why it's important that we make the plans and the upfront investments now to ensure the transition happens and to ensure that it happens in a way that is fair to everyone. We need to take these actions soon. And you and I, we can't do this on our own. We can't solve this problem on our own. We need governments to set the incentives. And that's why there's one thing I want everyone to do after this talk. Grab a pen, grab a keyboard, grab your phone, and write to your federal representatives asking for more upfront action on climate change. Our research shows that the most impactful thing that an individual can do is to vote or to contact their representatives. Because they hear from lobbyists all the time, but they don't hear from the average person very much. Now, that trip I took up the hill in Fiji all those years ago, well, it ended up leading to years of doing research with people in the Pacific Islands. And on my last trip before the pandemic, I was in the Republic of Kiribati. It's a low-lying island nation in the central Pacific Ocean. You may have never heard of Kiribati before, and that's okay, but I bet you've seen pictures of it. You see, the international media likes to present the country as sort of ground zero for climate change. But the truth is, the people there are much more resilient than any headline would have you think. And so while I was there, my friend and colleague, Eriatara Ram, gave a speech. And in it, he kept repeating this one line. Si tang ma tai tu. Si tang ma tai tu. It translates to, you can cry, but then get up. Absolutely, cry if it helps. Climate change, it, it is scary. But then let's get up, let's turn on those imaginations, and let's get to work. Thank you.